live from the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez, America's favorite late night talk program, featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Welcome to the Monday edition of the program. Our phone number, if you want to join our late-night national town hall conversation, feel free to give us a call, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. And uh, there's a bunch of things going on, but not that much. I mean, we're going into the week before Christmas here, and uh, obviously, you know, things slow down. A lot of people are on vacation and whatnot. And uh, there's a story coming out of Texas that the cops in Texas are now given the power to uh, arrest illegal aliens. We'll uh, talk about that and how that's going to lead to a showdown with the feds. We've also got um, a poll. 54% of Democrat voters want to replace Joe Biden as the 2024 nominee. Democrats are officially now, the majority, are now sour on Biden. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's a thing. Can't say we didn't see that coming. Um, let's see. The Democrats are doubling down on attacks on Clarence Thomas. No surprise there. <clears throat> Biden uh, Biden is a write-in candidate in the New Hampshire primary. Ay, ay, ay. Ay, bendito. And again, the uh, Biden approval rating has sunk even further. So I want to get into that as well. Um, Plus the uh, immigration stuff. Now, let me see. There was something here on good old Biden. Let me see. Where did it go? Where did it go? I don't see it. But um, I want to go. I want to go to this clip of Trump. Trump spoke at the Turning Point um, America Fest over the weekend. And he had a couple of things to say. Uh, Count Delacula, are we ready to roll? All right, so we're going to go with, let's see. Oh, here they are. I found them, 8, 9, and 10, with President Trump discussing the silent majority. Listen to this. The great silent majority is rising like never before. And under our leadership, the forgotten men and women will be forgotten no longer. We will love our country. We will take care of our country. We will pray to God for our strength and for our liberty. We will pray for God, and we will pray with God. We are one movement, one people, one family, and one glorious nation under God. And together, we will make America powerful again. America wealthy again. We will make America strong again. We will make America proud again. We will make America safe again. And we will make America great again. All right, so there's Trump doing what he does best, doing these rally speeches and uh, rallying up the troops. And uh, I think it, it's, it was a great um, clip because it was so dramatic, right? It was so dramatic, and the crowd is going wild. And it reminded me of that time that, that Joe Biden was giving a speech and the crowd was going wild. Right, right. There, there wasn't. We didn't have any audio. <laughs> that hasn't happened, right? People don't really uh, dig Joe Biden. That's why 54% of Democrat voters want to replace Joe Biden as the 2024 nominee. The uh, party voters in the, on the Democrat side are very upset. Uh, Biden, who's 81 now, is the presumptive Democrat nominee to ch- uh, challenge who uh, many presume will be the Republican nominee, former President Donald Trump, then Aldous Magnus El Trumpito, the 45th president of these United States, facing off against the 46th president of the United States, presumably. And uh, this Fox News poll on Sunday revealed that 54% of Democrats say no thank you. <clears throat> That's Democrat primary voters. Um, they want an alternative to Biden. Now, 43% of Democrat primary voters want to actually keep Biden. 
Okay. Well, good luck to you, sir. I don't mind keeping Biden. Uh, listen, I think uh, the only person I'd like to see run more than Biden is is Kamala Harris. I think she's an instant win for any Republican. Uh, now, in October, 53% preferred somebody other than Biden. Um, and in March, 52%. So um, this has been uh, somewhat consistent with the number growing every month. Now, Biden previously told um, the press back in the um, beginning of the month that he must run for re-election after prominent Democrats implored him to reconsider the bid. And he said, would you be running if Trump wasn't running? And he said, I expect so, Brian, I have to run, right? And making it some sort of, he's like, a, um, he's like a, if, if he doesn't run, he'll be a martyr, right? He, he has to run. This is his duty. This is what he has to do. So that, that's where he is. Now, there's a third of Americans that give uh, Biden a, a thumbs up on the job he's doing. This is also in uh, Fox News, uh, according to uh, a new uh, public opinion survey. The president stands at 34 percent approval in a Monmouth University poll that was released earlier today. 61 percent giving Biden a thumbs down on his job performance. 61 percent don't like Biden. I mean, that's a horrible number. Now, uh, the president's approval is at an all time low in this in this particular poll. Uh, Biden took over the White House a couple of years ago and has consistently just really um, started to slide on that number. So there you go. Joe El Baboso Biden. Will he stay? Will he make it? I don't know. I really don't know what what the next step for him is. I do know that. Uh, if that trend continues, it's great for America, right? I think it's a good thing for, for everybody in the country. Um, let's see. We'll get into the immigration stuff a little bit further ahead. Plus, there's a there's a piece that's in Newsweek that I want to bring some attention to by uh, Lee Habib, which um, talks about why McCarthyism on college campuses has become the latest um, hate-fueled rage to um, be directed towards Israel. And I thought it was really interesting, so I want to discuss that coming up straight ahead. Uh, Plus, later on tonight, we're going to talk about a couple of other interesting topics that I don't want you to miss out on. Uh, There's been a development. uh, A civil suit was um, won by one of the J6, January 6th uh, defendants who's been on this show in the past. We're going to talk about that victory that came in today. And uh, then a little bit later on, the process of the brain becoming indoctrinated. What does that process look like? How does one's brain become indoctrinated? Well, we're going to talk about that um, with uh, somebody who knows it really, really well. So I want you to stick around, stick with us. If you want to join the conversation, feel free, 833-482-5337. Of course, it's Christmas week or the week before Christmas. Twas the week before Christmas on America at Night. And I'm looking forward to speaking with you guys, of course, uh, during open phones and throughout the, the evening tonight. If you want to chime in on any one of those um, uh, conversations we're having with our guests, feel free, uh, 833-482-5337. 8334-VALDEZ. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. This is America this is night. This is Rich Valdez. All right, America, welcome back, familia. So check it out. There's a piece in Newsweek, and it says, Arab like me? How 40 years of campus McCarthyism led to hatred of Israel. Interesting piece, and I want the author of the piece to break it down for us. Uh, It's written by Newsweek columnist Lee Habib. He's also a VP of content at Salem Media and the host of Our American Stories. And uh, I briefly met Lee Habib at the Talkers Conference this year. It was a quick hello and goodbye. Uh, Very, very great uh, story that he's got. And uh, I'm glad that he's here with us on the program. Lee Habib, welcome, sir. Well, thanks for having me. And uh, good good to connect with you on the air this time. 
You bet, brother. So I want to uh, dig in here a little bit to um, to your uh, to your piece in Newsweek, uh, because I think it's a it's an interesting take. And um, uh, feel free to just kind of uh, elaborate for everybody who hasn't had a chance to read it yet. Well, sure. What I try to do is tell a personal story about my life as a person with an Arabic last name who was involved in the end on campus culture back in 1983 when I was in college in a large private school called Fairleigh Dickinson University, which wasn't far from Columbia University. And Columbia at the time and a lot of the Ivy League schools were just starting to push a theory on the fringes that had to do with seeing the world through a lens of oppressed and oppressor and the colonized and the colonizer. And this was new. Before then, it was, what was the communist system a solid economic system? And by the 50s and 60s, we knew, the world knew that was dead. So how would Marxism reinvent itself? Well, I was on the cutting edge because in 1983, I was the editor-in-chief of a large college newspaper, and the, the Marine Brett Barracks in Beirut had been blown up by Islamic terrorists, Mm -hmm. because what were Americans doing in the region? We deserved it, right? And Israel was on the border of this great civil war happening in my grandfather's home country, Lebanon. And here I am an Arab, and I take the side of America and Israel in my college paper, and quickly I'm disowned by the Arabs. I expected that because anti-Semitism is taught to Arabs. It's literally a part of the curriculum in the Middle East. Um, it goes way back uh, all the way to the protocols of the elders of Zion, which was a propaganda track used first by the Soviets and before the Soviets with Russia pogroms by Hitler to justify the, the elimination of the Jews, and then ultimately made its way to the Middle East, thanks to Hitler. And then the Marxists of the Soviet Union who had a big influence in the Middle East during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. So I expected the Arab anti-Semitism. I'd been around it all my life. And my family had had to dissociate ourselves from many Arabs who just said such nasty things about Jews that were not only not true, but with the kind of tropes that led to the Holocaust. So Le- and Lebanese, by the way, never really consider ourselves Arab. Lebanon and Beirut, where my grandfather was from, was a right. very Western city like Tel Aviv is today. Uh, Jews and Christians and, and, and Muslims sat down together. Atheists, it was French influence. It was a European influence. It was a very tolerant place. Private property rights, intellectual property rights thrived. It was an oasis in the Middle East. And, and what I didn't expect was the small but growing fringe of white radicals who were going to sit me down from mostly the humanities, from the anthropology department, sociology, from literature, sit me down, white people mostly, and explain to me that I was white, even though I'm dark skinned, and that I was white because I was thinking like a white person, acting like a white person. This, of course, I expected because I'd been reading the literature they'd been reading. And that basically was Franz Fanon. I urge your listeners to read a book called Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon. You'll understand everything. And then read a little bit of Michael Foucault. He's another French uh, philosopher who really dug in this new way of rebranding Marxism through an oppressor and oppressed module. What was really interesting to me, though, was the, the level and degree of superiority these white kids felt by simply siding with the oppressed. And that if you sided with the oppressed, in this case, it was the Palestinians, the Lebanese, the dark-skinned people of the Middle East, and the oppressor were these mighty powers called America and Israel. And if you sided with the oppressed, you were virtuous instantly. By the way, you didn't have to do anything. You just had to simply state the claim that you were with the oppressed. And Mm -hmm. I had to choose between being with the oppressed and the oppressor, of course, I thought this was a mere rubbish. And I was, if I was colonized by anything, it was the great Western civilization canon, uh, Western law, uh, property rights, uh, Western literature, Western thought. It's changed the world. And I always prayed that more of Western enlightenment and Western constitutional governance and rights and property rights would be conferred to Arabs. But Arabs seemed to want nothing to do with it, at least the Arabs I knew, and there were a few thousand at that campus. So in came the lectures, and in came the insults, 
And pretty soon I was not invited to any parties with these white kids. And I was an English major and a history minor and an economics minor. And suddenly I was just disowned not only by the Arab community, but I was disowned by this small and obnoxious fringe, which 40 years later would become the professors and the college presidents of these campuses. And they would come to dominate through exclusion, through canceling of, of people who disagreed with them through other McCarthyistic tactics that the right had used during the 50s wrongfully. Um, the left was now using every single day. And I was one of the, I think, one of the early victims of this. And I sympathize with so many of my black conservative friends who were disowned not only by blacks and called an Uncle Tom for being conservative mm -hmm. and loving Western civilization, but also disowned by white liberals and being told they weren't black. And it's always amusing to me when white people accuse me of being white when they're the white people. And that I'm, <laughs> I am white, not brown, because I don't think correctly. And um, I didn't take any of this personally, by the way. I just observed it, and I started to write about it and think about it. And then when 10 7 occurred, and I'm watching everything that's happening on campus, I'm not surprised. 40 years later, this is Gen 3 of this rubbish, this cancer now spread through the campuses of this country, undergrad, and now even pushed down into the, into the high schools of America as unfettered truth that the, the, the colonial empires and the white empires are evil and, uh, and the dark ones are innocent and good. And it's just, it's so goofy and so silly. And so many Arabs like me, when I wrote this piece, wrote me to thank me. And they also thanked me. I'd written a piece about three weeks earlier, just about Arab anti-Semitism and how deep it is and how powerful it is. And since then, several Muslims have gotten together and wrote their own versions of what I wrote, which is we've been trained to hate Jews and trained from day one that they're the devil, that they steal, that they lie, that they, they, they extract from the world. And these tropes have been around forever. And I think 10-7 has been one of these great dividing moments in our history where we have to look at the reality and say, what the heck happened? And that Bill Maher is making these observations, a traditional Democrat and liberal, and so many uh, liberal donors to these universities are, I, I believe, finally understanding the monster they created over the last 40 years, they can't control. They can't control. This is a uh, very impactful Lee Habib uh, because it's, it's a perspective you don't hear every day. Um, I think we, we, we hear uh, a lot of the, the left and the oppressor story. And then we hear a lot of people just reacting uh, and defending Israel, but you don't always hear Arabs uh, chiming in and giving their take on it. Uh, so I'd love to hear a little bit more about it. I also want to hear about the Arab anti-Semitism you talked about in that other piece, uh, because I think it's such a, a unique perspective and I'd like to let the audience know a little bit about your story as well. So stick with us. Lee Habib is our guest. If you want to join the conversation, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. We're coming right back with Lee Habib. Don't go anywhere. With Rich Valdez, we understand that that the negotiators are are are, are not not us, but the negotiators in, in that are in question here uh, have had some conversations uh, in the last couple of days. We we hope that that becomes a, a fruitful discussion, but um, I, I can't promise you a date certain where uh, where we could get another one in place. Just that we're continuing to work it really really hard. That is National Security spokes, uh, Council spokesman John Kirby saying that obviously they continue to have hopes of another deal to release more hostages held by Hamas. And um, we've been discussing uh, how the anti-Semitism is just so steeped 
in uh, what's going on in the culture on college campuses as well as um, in Arab culture. And uh, Lee Habib, he's a columnist uh, for Newsweek, was explaining that. He's also the host of Our American Stories and what a storyteller he is. And uh, he was just mentioning to us about a, a, a similar piece he'd written that focused on Arab anti-Semitism and the tragedy that it is. Lee Habib, welcome back. Tell us more about that. Well, and I also want to add that what, what you're seeing on the college campuses may appear to be anti-Semitism. You may think these kids hate Jews, but what they hate is Israel. What they hate is the Jews' success. What they hate is the Jews' embrace of capitalism. So they're, they seem to be anti-Semitic, but their anti-Semitism is much more an anti-Westernism. It's an anti-capitalism. It's an anti-the uh, powerful versus the powerless. So it's not that they hate Jews. It's they, they hate Israel. And they don't know that what they're saying offends Jews. They don't even know what from the river to the sea means. They don't know what river, and they don't know what sea. So it, it, know that that kind of anti-Semitism, which I call sheer ignorance, is different mm. than the kind of programmed anti-Semitism in which Arabs are told Jews are the problem. Jews are evil. So it's not just that they hate Israel. They hate Jews. And they blame the Jews for many of the problems or try to sabotage themselves by blaming Israel for all the problems of the Middle East. And all of my life, I, I would never hear any of my Arab friends be upset about Muammar Gaddafi, never upset about Saddam Hussein. When Rafiq Hariri got blown up, the prime minister of Lebanon, a shrug. When Lebanon basically got taken over by Hezbollah over the last decade, a shrug. When Syria was involved in a conflagration, a shrug. Uh, but the second you mention Israel to my Arab friends, oh, they just lose it. And so in that piece, what I wrote about is, well, why do they hate Jews? And I, and I said, well, there, there's a bunch of reasons. First, envy, coveting. Um, they, Israel is this tiny country the size of New Jersey. And they're two percent of the world's point two percent of the world's population, but twenty two percent of the world's Nobel Prize winners. They have all yeah. kinds of freedom there, welfare. It's a startup nation. But then I thought, no, it, it's more than just that. It's the Jewish roots. It's their legal and moral roots that trace back to the Torah. Their God isn't the Muslim God, and their God is a, a, a different God. So they rejected the Muslim God. And following their God and their rules, they flourished, while Muslims in the Middle East have followed their God and not. By the way, I always ask my liberal friends, where would you rather live as a gay person or a woman, Israel or anywhere else in the Middle East? But then when I really dug into it, it really was just ultimately a, a, a sort of hatred of not just Jews, but Christians. You know, there are 580 yeah. million people living in the Middle East there are only 12,000 Jews. And there used to be 20% Christians in the Middle East, and that's down to 4%. So what's happened in the Middle East, particularly over the last 20 years, is it's gotten more intolerant, as the world has been talking about tolerance. And the greatest thing that I've seen as an Arab was some of the Arab governments, particularly around the Abram Accords, and particularly around this, this, uh, uh, this relationship that was just starting to form between Israel and Saudi Arabia. And I think that was the real reason for 10-7. More right. Arabs were coming out and saying, enough's enough. Israel's not our enemy. Iran is. Iran right. and those mullahs funding Hezbollah. Iran and those mullahs funding them terrorists. It's all like African-Americans finally just saying fatherlessness is the problem. And those gangsters and those gangs that spawn from fatherless, the cops aren't the problem. Right. We're the problem. This is a hard thing to admit that our own culture has allowed Jews to be the center and animating passion to all of our problems when we refuse to look at a mirror, refuse to look at our own culture and our own ways and fix and change them. And the Middle East was heading in that direction. What Trump did in the Abram Accords, bringing five Islamic nations to the table to normalize relations with Israel, I believe that's why 10-7 happened. Because Hamas knows it's coming to an end. It's coming to an end. Amigos, we're on with Lee Habib. He's a Newsweek columnist and uh, the host of uh, Our American Stories. And 
Uh, Lee Habib, you mentioned something I thought that was really poignant, and it was this difference that you pointed out between anti-Jew sentiment and anti-Israel sentiment, one informed um, or infused by hate and the other one informed by a, a lack of understanding or ignorance. And I, I want you to you know, kind of go a few layers deep on that uh, because it, it's something I've never really observed. I think there are passive anti-Semites that are like, yeah, they the bandwagon anti-Semites, if you will, that kind of jump on the bandwagon just because it's cultural in their, um, in their cultural Marxism, if you will, in their leftist uh, playbook. Uh, but then there's others that genuinely uh, despise the idea of a Jewish state. Um, I- I've never really put much of a distinction, a distinction between the two, but you did, and I thought it was pretty eloquent, but I'd like to have a better understanding. Sure. Think about the average campus radical and think about what their feelings are towards America. Now, there are ethnic types all over this country, Indian Americans, Arab Americans like me, black Americans, but they hate the country and they hate the country for what it stands for. They hate capitalism. They hate freedom. They truly hate our system. Now, I don't know why they do. I don't know what they want to replace it with, but this has been taught to them over 40 to 50 years. America has gotten its wealth through theft. We stole the slaves. We stole their labor, and that's how we got wealthy. It's such rubbish. Most of the wealth accrued in the United States has happened in the last 50 years. You add up the wealth of the last 50 years, it's five times more than the wealth of the entire history of the nation. Software, hardware, oil discoveries, manufacturing class. This is when America started to be a productive nation. Slavery is not a way to build a nation. It's not a way to build. It was wrong. But that's not how America got wealthy. It's just nonsense. And slavery was always with us around the world. So this anti-Westernism is what these kids hate. They hate Western civilization, mm-hmm. but they've never been educated about Western Civ. Because when I study literature, I was studying Shakespeare, and Chekhov, and Dostoevsky, and the Bible. I'm reading these, these incredibly challenging books that make us look within ourselves, in our own hearts, for our own evil. I'm not looking to uh, look to others for what they did to me because I'm so capable of ruining my own life with my own decisions. And that's why we study Shakespeare. A fellow ruins his own own life with the help of Iago, a saboteur. We all have saboteurs in our life, and sometimes that saboteur is the guy looking at us in the mirror. That's really interesting. When you reduce all of human life to a power struggle, between the rich and the poor, the dark and the light. This becomes stupid, but it is what these kids have adopted. So they no more hate Jews than they hate Americans. They hate America. That's it. They hate America. And the Americans who love America, they don't like. They think we're idiots, and they think we're sellouts, and they think we're against the cause for the poor when little do they know but capitalism in the West and food production of the West have lifted people out of poverty and hunger in ways that socialism and Marxism cannot, never have, and never will. But they've never been taught anything. They've never read Adam Smith. They don't even know the, the, the reason for separation of powers in our Constitution or how our Bill of Rights means something and the Soviet, Bill of, Soviet Union's Bill of Rights, which they had, meant nothing. They know nothing. They've been programmed like poor little ideological tools for the cause by a vapid graduate school and college system that's been overrun by leftists for the past 40 years. In the end, I really don't blame these kids. They've been, I blame us. The conservatives and thoughtful defenders of Western Civ did nothing while the takeover of these schools were happening. We were busy living our lives and doing what we did. And many of us who sounded the alarms, I went, I, I started Laura Ingram's national radio show. We did that together. We went to the University of Virginia Law School together. And we were sounding the alarms when we were in law school. And even my conservative friends were like, oh, it's just a few professors. I go, no, it's all the young professors at UVA Law. Every single one of them is a leftist, and they don't even know our point of view. They don't even read Scalia's opinions. They don't have an opinion about his opinions because they've never even read them. They just hate him. Very sad. That's it. Very sad. Very sad and tragic for the mind of these kids because what a thing to do to children, to brainwash them. Uh, It's the worst thing you can do even as a parent. Think this way. 
don't think any other way. I'm right, you're wrong. You're going to have a very either rebellious kid or a very uncurious kid. But in the end, a kid who doesn't get to think for themselves. And what a bore. I mean, of all the things I could say about this, it was, what a bore, right? And how tiresome. Yeah. And uh, regrettably for these kids, and I, by the way, this is not the majority of our kids because they're not English majors. And the majority of kids on campus, <laughs> right. I live in Oxford, Mississippi, yeah. home to Ole Miss. Most of these kids are accounting majors, pharmacy majors, business majors. They're forced to take a couple of these stupid classes. They roll their eyes. They grin and bear it. We don't have to worry that the mass amounts of our kids are marching. These are mostly yeah. Ivy League schools. The minority. And they're not doing – there's not 80,000 of these kids marching into the 80 – in the 80,000 kids at Penn State, the 60,000 kids at the University of Alabama, the 30,000 kids at Ole Miss. There's a few hundred kids marching around making idiots of themselves who will never have a job, will never work, and will live on their parents' payroll for a very long time. Embittered, nasty, ugly mm -hmm. children who become embittered, nasty, ugly adults. I, say, I, I feel Lee sad Habib? for them because they have no chance H in life. Hang no on chance. one second, Lee. We've got to take a quick pause. I'm going to come right back so you could finish that thought and tell us a little bit about uh, our American stories. Folks, we're on with Lee Habib, and we're coming right back. Don't move a muscle. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. Loving Latino. America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, familia, welcome back, amigos. We continue our conversation with Lee Habib. Uh, he's a columnist at Newsweek and he's also the host of Our American Stories. Lee Habib, um, excellent commentary in the last segment there. I think yeah, you, you hit it on the head with um, the, the, the mindless zombies that just hate America and confusing their hatred of America for hating the Western civilization that they see um, coming out of Israel and the genuine um, hardcore dyed-in-the-wool anti-Semites and, um, and how it's a minority of, of children and, and young adults in our, on our college campuses that are suffering from this. But uh, I want, before we wrap, I want to make sure you had an opportunity to tell us about Our American Stories it's a very unique program, and I wanted you to share a little bit about it. Sure. I uh, started about six years ago. The whole goal was to, to do a story, do, do a storytelling show only. No opinion, no uh, phone calls, uh, a, a pre-produced uh, show, sort of like This American Life from NPR, except we like the country. And so we have <laughs> stories about everything every day. Uh, George Washington surrendering his commission is coming up. The, the Churchill speech that he gave and came to the country around Christmas time of 1941, that no one's ever heard. Best speech I think he ever gave in his life that no one knows. And, uh, but at the same time, we'll do stories about uh, the, the first Black Medal of Honor winner, um, the story of Pistol Pete Maravich um, and his coming to Christ, Johnny Cash's life story with Pastor Greg Laurie. Um, and many of the best museums and the best storytellers in the country and historians uh, now come on the show and tell the stories of, of the, the, the subjects that they care about. So it's, it's a show about everything. And it, it covers sports, music. Or one of my favorite things is just the stories of how songs come to be. The Kenny Chesney song, this, there, there Goes My Life, how that song came to be. You'll cry mm. listening to it. Or George On My Mind and how Ray Charles recorded this Hoagie Carmichael song. Uh, and, and Hoagie Carmichael was white and dead, and Ray Charles didn't want to do black music anymore. He wanted to sing white music and then country music, and he was not accused of being a cultural appropriator. It was called the sharing culture of artists. So we do these beautiful stories every night, available on podcasts, heard over the radio, and uh, it's one of the fastest-growing podcasts in the country because there's no debate, there's no argument, there's no left versus right. It's just the stories of a good and beautiful country and the stories of who built the country. 
and stories of love and sacrifice. And uh, we just stay away from the, 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 the debate because at a certain point, we want to f- forget what we are arguing about and remember the things that are worth remembering and worth loving about our country. And there's so much to love. And we don't spend enough time loving on this country. And that was the purpose of the, of the show. And uh, we've gotten the Ambrose estate now to give us all of Stephen Ambrose's oral, oral storytelling. And he's been dead for years. But there's that wonderful voice once every two weeks or so. You hear him talking about the, you know, all of his great books, um, from his Eisenhower bio to the great biography of Lewis and Clark to the Transcontinental Railroad, my favorite. Um, and so many great Abe Lincoln stories, Washington stories, Constitution stories, but also art and sports stories. So um, it's Our American Stories, and you can get it at wherever you get your podcasts. And you, we, we send you three to five stories a day, every day, uh, all year round. Outstanding. Lee Habib, let everybody know how they could follow you on social media or uh, you know, get a hold of you online. Uh, the, actually, the best thing we can, or, or any listener can do is just start listening to our podcast. Um, just go find Our American Stories on iTunes, uh, wherever you get your podcasts. We're there. And just start, just start listening. Uh, we're a nonprofit, and uh, we, we just want more and more people to fall in love with their country. Outstanding. Well, brother, keep up uh, the hard work, um, you know, ringing that bell for liberty and doing what you do. I, I know I appreciate it, and there's many others out there that appreciate it as well. Godspeed to you, sir. And thanks for having me, Rich. You bet. Merry Christmas. Folks, we're going to come right back with your phone calls and more straight ahead. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. America, welcome back. It's not quite Feliz Navidad, but it is. And uh, we want to have Christmas music uh, all week. We're, um, that was my request, that we have some Christmas music as we bump back into each segment. Because, I mean, you know, before you know it, I'll be off for, for the Christmas break, and we'll be hearing, um, I know they, in the radio business, they call it best of, right? The best of Rich Valdez. But I, I, I don't know why. In my brain, it, it, it always comes across as greatest hits. <laughs> Like like it's a top 40 radio show or, uh, you know, a compilation album. So uh, we'll be playing our greatest hits uh, pretty soon as we take off some time to celebrate uh, the birth of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And uh, until then, we're going to hear some Christmas music. So uh, join me, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDES. Let's go to Ralph in Burlington, Vermont, WVMT. Uh, Ralph, what's on your mind tonight? Hey, little buddy. Uh, just uh, thanks for taking my call. I'm just concerned about Burlington, Vermont. As I grew up here, it was wonderful. We had uh, Canadians, we had Germans, we had Italians, we had all sorts of diversity, and everybody got together, you know, community wise. Well, that's the way you got to do it, now. Ralph. Uh, I hate to let you go. You're right. Now things are a lot worse. The music means they're kicking both of us out of here. Uh, but the reality is I think things were more civil when you were younger, even when I was younger. And now we're in bad shape, and we've got all these cultural Marxists that are running amok, hating America and hating the Jews as well. Folks, we're coming right back with another hour of programming for you. Don't miss it. It's live. It's national. And you're invited to join us. Don't go anywhere. I'm Rich Valdez. the city that never sleeps 17 miles from madison square garden new york city it's america at night 
with Rich Valdez, America's favorite late night talk program featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Welcome to Hour 2 of the program. If you want to join our late-night national town hall conversation, feel free. Give me a call, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. And a couple of quick headlines. The majority of Democrats are now opposed to Biden as the 2024 nominee. Uh, the threshold is passed. Fifty four percent of Democrats say they want somebody else, not Biden. Uh, then we've got let's see, we've got uh, a couple other interesting stories here. Biden's going to be a write in candidate in the New Hampshire primary. I mean, if if that doesn't say this guy's not taking it seriously, I don't know what does either that or it's the height of arrogance. Right. And of course, Biden's approval ratings have sunk to an all time low And that has nothing to do with his car getting hit, the motorcade, the presidential motorcade getting uh, smacked up earlier today. Uh, But there's other things in the news that I want to talk about. And one of them are uh, one of the headlines that I want to talk about is this one. A a January 6th civil case against uh, Brandon Strzok, you know him from the walkaway campaign. And it was led by the uh, very corrupt, in my opinion, Soros-funded D.C. nonprofit law firm, Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. And they lost. They lost to Brandon uh, in the the civil case that they had against them. And uh, Brandon Strzok is here with us to tell us all about it. Brandon Strzok, welcome, sir. Hey, good to be here. Thanks, Rich. You bet, brother. Merry Christmas. So uh, tell us, uh, how did this go down? How do you feel that you, you won your civil case? Oh, man, it, it, it's amazing. Honestly, it's amazing because please keep in mind, this, was a, this is a federal case, civil case, that was brought in the District of Columbia. Of course, they do that on purpose. So, I mean, I went into this, two, I was served two years and three months ago. And, you know, so I've been going through this for going on two and a half years. And uh, – the, the judge in my case is uh, uh, Ahmed Mehta, which is a Barack Obama appointed judge. Yeah. And every possible card was stacked against me in this case, but I got to hand it to my lawyer. Um, my lawyer just out lawyered this group of Soros uh, funded attorneys and uh, <laughs> we pulled out a victory and it's pretty incredible. Outstanding. Brandon, I want you to just back up a little bit so that everybody who's just tuning in right now and may not uh, remember your story from the last time you were on, uh, t- walk us briefly through your story, what happened, and how this civil uh, suit came about. Right. So on January 6th, I was a scheduled speaker for a permitted event that was supposed to take place at the Capitol, but never did because of what went down. And when I was arriving for my speaking engagement, I started getting text messages and things from people saying that they were hearing on television that people were going inside the building. So I walked up to the east side steps and I filmed outside of the building for eight minutes. I never entered the Capitol on January 6th. I didn't touch anybody. I didn't engage in any violence, any vandalism, any destruction. And I'll say, nor did I witness anybody, n- witness any. None, nobody was behaving that way on the side of the building that I was on. The doors were already open on the east side of the Capitol. And some people are trying to push their way in. And others were just standing there shooting a video. So that's what I did. I shot a video and then I uploaded my video to Twitter. Uh, but largely because of who I am, two and a half weeks later, the FBI raided my house and took me to jail and I sat in jail for several days. And then I finally got out and real and discovered that I was being criminally charged by the federal government for the eight minutes that I stood outside of the Capitol on January 6th. Now about nine to 10 months after I was arrested, I got a knock on my door and I opened my door and a man hands me a stack of papers about two, three inches thick, uh, which say that I'm being sued by eight Capitol Police officers who are black and brown suing me under the KKK Act, alleging that I (laughs) engage in a white supremacist attack 
and uh, a conspiracy to deprive them of their civil rights and that I caused their quote unquote injuries on January 6th. What's I, I under you're laughing as you should, because it's insane, but these officers weren't even working on the same side of the building that I was on, but wow. alleging that I owed them money for assault and battery. And, um, you know, it cost me six figures to, to get to this point of victory. Wow. And I'm very lucky and I'm very grateful because I have a lot of people out there who support me and who help me through this both emotionally and, and spiritually and financially. Uh, otherwise, this would have been completely catastrophic. But it's, um, it's incredibly stressful going through something like this and thinking that you may be going to trial in Washington, D.C., on uh, on counts of aiding and abetting assault and assault and battery and, and civil rights conspiracy, uh, it's a it's a very stressful situation. Um, wow! Yeah. But uh, here we are, and uh, we had a very happy outcome. Well, I, I want to hear a little bit more about the strategy of how you won the case and, and all of that because that that's fascinating. And I, I wasn't really uh, up to speed on all of the details uh, that that the, these cops were using this uh, Soros funded law firm. To, to sue you under the KKK Act. <laughs> I really, I have to laugh yeah. because I, the incredulity is just overcoming me, right? It's, I don't think it's funny. I just think it's crazy. And uh, that's nervous. It's over laughter. the top. It really is. Folks, we're on with Brandon Strzok. You can check him out at his website, Brandon Strzok, and that's Strzok with an A at the end. It's silent A. It's kind of like Valdez with an S. Uh, Brandon Strzok, S-T-R-A-K-A dot com. Uh, you can check him out there. We're going to come right back with Brandon to hear the rest of his story about this victory, how he won his January 6th civil case where they, uh, they were coming at him on some crazy stuff. Uh, we're going to get to that and more, of course, your uh, calls uh, on this topic. We're happy to go to them if they um, if they match up with what we're talking about. We'll go for it. 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. Thank you for everything. I know you very well, and I have I listen, but I have a lot of people that listen, and they love your show, and I appreciate it very much. America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, we're rocking the Christmas music here uh, because, you know, it's almost Christmas, and uh, it's Christmas for Brandon Strzok, for sure, who won his civil case, uh, this January 6th case, where they said they uh, he was somehow um, violating the KKK Act. I've never heard of such a thing, honestly. It's just so bizarre to me. Brandon Strzok, welcome back. Tell us uh, again a little bit about uh, this this KKK Act and how you had violated it, and what did your lawyer do to, to get you off? Yeah, well, it's it's beyond comprehension. Uh, so what they, what they alleged in this suit, which was, I don't know, 60, 70 pages long, um, and again, I, let's make very clear here, with great intention, what I believe happened is that this, this law firm cooked up this idea. And then I believe that they went out and found the eight Capitol Police officers who fit the bill, uh, which is right. to say that you know, they found people who are non-Caucasian, and said, can we throw your, your name on this lawsuit and move forward because we want to sue yeah. these guys under the KKK Act. You know, a lot of this was about just trying to destroy people's names, destroy their reputation, and, of course, destroy them financially as well. Right. But, you know, essentially, essentially what's being alleged here is that um, th- that Donald Trump intentionally targeted areas to say there was voter fraud that were mostly black in population, you know, places like Atlanta, Detroit, and, and things like oh, that. Boy. And that I went out and I spread Donald Trump's lies and then I – got people whipped up into a frenzy. And because of me, January 6th happened. And because of me, these black officers were hurt in this white su- supremacist attack. I mean, it's the most absurd thing. But remember, when you're dealing with the District of Columbia, anything goes. Yeah, anything I mean, it's possible. like they're, they're right there. There's no boundary too far that we can't possibly leap over it. And so 
essentially my lawyer wrote a really great motion to dismiss. And through that, he got four of the six counts against me dismissed. But the judge kept me in two counts uh, because he said he thought that it was possible that I could have been involved in the in the assault and battery of these plaintiffs and that we would have to go through a discovery to find out whether or not I was. And my lawyer came up with a very creative idea basically to say, look, you know, now that there's only two counts remaining against you, they're really not federal counts. They they are counts that could be kicked to the district court. And so we could go to the judge and tell him that he really doesn't have jurisdiction to keep you in this case. But my lawyer said, as a matter of fact, he could rule that he does. It's, it's really up to him. And since he's probably out to get you anyway, that's probably how he'll rule. Well, lo and behold, it took nine months to get an answer. But the judge actually agreed with our arguments that these are that these are counts that should be in a district court. And so he dismissed me on these counts, but he said, you know, the, the plaintiffs do have the right, if they want to, to refile these counts against me in the district court. At that point, my attorney went to the plaintiff's lawyers and said, you've seen the discovery, you've seen this case, you've been telling nothing but lies from the, from the moment you filed this case. And if you guys dare to file this in district court, we're going to come back on you guys and seek sanctions against all of the lawyers, and we're going to counter sue the hell out of all of you. And they just kind of put their hands up and said they cried uncle. And at that point, they signed a document saying that they will not pursue any more legal action against me. This is over. And they all signed it, and it's done. Wow. That's a pretty gangster lawyer you got. Good for you, Brandon Strong. It, it, it got a little gangster there at the end. <laughs> I mean, but this is, That's this how you gotta is play where with we're guys. at. That, this is how you got to play with these guys because it's a street fight. I mean, these guys go into the, – the Democrats go into everything now – like it's a dirty, dirty street fight. And you've got to be, I mean, we, at this point, we've got to be willing to roll up our sleeves and, and punch back just as hard as they're punching us. Otherwise we're not going to survive. Yeah. Now, how long have you been uh, colluding or conspiring with the KKK? <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. it's, it's so funny because if you look at the work that my organization does walk away, I mean, I have this long history over the last five and a half years of going into Harlem, downtown Los Angeles, Atlanta. I mean, we do so many events for the black community, for the Hispanic community. Yeah. I think you've even been a part of some of the sure. things that we've done. You know, and I always tell people like, you know, what kind of racist am I that I'm out there like raising money so that I can do free events in black communities? Like what, what kind of, like, I'm like the worst racist in the world. <laughs> You're failing. You're failing on the racist front. I'm uh, failing horribly. This is horrible. I mean, I'm really happy for you. Uh, and, and I'm glad that the, the judge, you know, played ball and, you know, was fair and honest and, and that your lawyer was able to achieve this. Uh, but it, it just it, it just strikes me, you know, I, I can't help but not see how if you're not Brandon Strzok and you don't have, you know, uh, all these people that support you and follow you in the walkaway campaign, if you're, you know, Joe Schmo that was also just there whipping out their cell phone camera, just watching what was going on. And there's cases against those people. It, th th they're going to get the book thrown at them, you know, because they don't have all of the, uh, the, the access and, and uh, that you have. And it just, it, it, it kills me that this is happening in our country. Rich, it kills me too. And, and it breaks my heart because let me tell you, see, I wasn't the only defendant in this case. Um, I, I'm, my co-defendants in this case are some proud boys, some Oath Keepers, some other just people that were there on January 6th. And I would say at least half, at least half of my co-defendants in this case are currently sitting in prison. So these are people who have already lost their homes. They've lost everything that they have because they can't even afford to defend themselves in criminal court. And they're just, you know, defaulting on this civil case. They don't have lawyers. They're not showing up for the hearings. So they're going to get a default judgment against them. So, you know, if they ever get out of prison, they're going to end up having, you know, a million dollar judgment against them because they couldn't wow. even afford an attorney to show up in court for them. I mean, it's honestly, it's too painful for me to even think about I, I, it's, what these what the District of Columbia, Columbia and these courts and these prosecutors and these Soros attorneys, what they have done to just average everyday people who don't, who are just trying to get by, who are just trying to pay their, their mortgage and put gas in their car. I mean, they have destroyed these people's lives permanently. And it, yeah, it's more than I can even bear to think about. Yeah. It's, it's pretty crazy stuff.
Now, I, I just I want to ask you a question just because we're talking about what's going on on Capitol Hill. Uh, very um, off the beaten path, but it's it's in the news. Uh, this Ben Cardin story about this staffer making uh, porn in the Senate uh, hearing room. Uh, what's what do you make of this? Why do I have to answer this question? Why? Why? why is you're on the radio? Why, why is Why is this crossing my desk? Um, no, I mean, I think the same thing everybody on our side of the aisle thinks. I mean, it's it's a disgrace, and the Democrats have. It's like they just when you think they can't find any new way to defile the seat of our government or the respectability of America and politics, it's something else. Within the last calendar year. We have had transgender people pull their breasts out on the White House lawn. We've had other transgender people stealing people's luggage at the airport and stealing their clothes. Uh, We have had uh, gay staffers having sex in the Senate floor. What we were told were the sacred halls of the Senate floor. Uh, We've had cocaine at the White House. Like, and this is all, you know, Joe Biden told us that he was going to bring decency and morality back to right. the Oval Office. And that morality is on um, the ballot. Yeah, morality is on the ballot. It certainly is. Unbelievable. Yeah, I, I just I, I can't make any sense of it. And uh, I was just wondering what you might have heard. Um, I, I forgot you're not you're not based out of D.C. or are you? No, 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 I'm not. Uh, I was yeah. never in D.C. I, I've gone back and forth between New York and uh, Nebraska. Okay. Got oh Nebraska, sounds lovely. Yeah. All right, Brandon Strzok, <laughs> Let everybody know how they can find out more about the the Walk Away campaign and and what you have coming down the pipe. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I would really encourage anyone to please check out um, WalkAwayFoundation dot org. I mean, here's the really great thing. I've spent the last three years defending myself in a criminal case and a civil case, and now. I can finally say a lot of this is behind me. I can put all my energy back in trying to regrow my organization and and refund my organization. So if people want to help us out, go to walkawayfoundation.org, walkawayfoundation.org, become a a donor, become a supporter, even if it's a dollar a month, $5 a month, whatever you can do. My organization is getting out there talking to minorities and minority communities, waking people up, getting people to walk away from the Democratic Party. We've gotten hundreds of thousands of people to leave the left and join us over here. And I feel like we're just getting started and next year's a big year. So walkawayfoundation.org, sign up for our email list, become a a sponsor of our organization and volunteer, get behind what we're doing and follow us on social media. Yeah. And give them the social media handle. Sure. So I would recommend people follow me at, uh, so my name is Brandon Strzok, B-R-A-N-D-O-N. Last name is spelled S T R. AKA there's a peculiar extra a on the end of my name. Uh, the last thing I'd like to say too, is that we launched our own social media app this year because Facebook banned walk away after January 6th, uh, mm. 2021. So now people can load walk away social in their app store and check out the great stories of people walking oh, away from cool. the democratic party. I walk remember you social. mentioning that last time. So I'm glad it's up yep. and running. Thanks for letting me put you on the spot. Brandon Strzok. Godspeed to you, brother. I'm happy that things worked out for you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thanks, Rich. You bet. All right, folks, we're coming right back. We're going to discuss how does the brain become indoctrinated? You don't want to miss this. Don't go anywhere. I'm Rich Valdez. America. Welcome back. Merry Christmas, familia. And amigos, I want to talk about the indoctrinated brain, right? Uh, because the, the mind is a fascinating thing, in my opinion. And there's, there's a lot that's always going on, focusing on, on one's brain. Uh, throughout the world, you got mental capacity that's declining, especially amongst young people. Uh, depression rates are rising dramatically. Meanwhile, one in 40 men and women suffer from Alzheimer's at the age of, uh, let's see, at the age of onset. The, uh, 
number of that age, or I guess the degree, the the age range is falling rapidly. And that's scary to think, you know, my, my dad had some dementia and it kicked in later on in life for him. But just imagine that kicking in sooner for some people, right? That onset coming in one's 30s or 40s versus, you know, 70s or 80s. That's, uh, that's alarming. Uh, but the causes are not being eliminated. Quite the opposite. Can this just be a coincidence? Well, that's a blurb uh, from the um, description to a book called The Indoctrinated Brain, How to Successfully Fend Off the Global Attack on Your Mental Freedom. And if that's not a provocative headline, I don't know what is. The author is Dr. Michael Nels. He's a medical doctor and a molecular geneticist, both MD and PhD, uh, who's put this remarkable book together. And uh, I'm fascinated by this topic, so I want to bring in Dr. Michael Nels. Welcome, sir. Uh, Welcome. (laughs) Thank you very much, Rich. I'm very pleased to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. So let's uh, let's dig into this because, I mean, it's not every day that you, A, you read about this type of work, and um, B, that it's coming from somebody who's both, um, you know, a scientist and and a medical doctor who who can really explain explain the... um, you know, the neurobiological mechanisms that really make this, this work. So what, what was the impetus for you? Why did you want to write a book on the indoctrinated brain? Well, I had to explain to myself what was going on the last four years, actually what was going on the last decades, because I published already a scientific article in 2016. Where it's mm-hmm. called, the article was called The Unified Theory of Alzheimer's Disease. And there I show that Alzheimer's is uh, actually caused by um, a lack of production of new nerve cells in our autobiographical memory. And uh, by keeping up the production, which is actually natural, but not normal anymore, (laughs) but if it's natural, then uh, nobody would get Alzheimer's. And when I realized what was going on in uh, 2020, uh, it was clear to me that the Alzheimer's rates will, uh, will rise, the same with the depression rates, which also hinge on the production of these new nerve cells in the autobiographical memory. So it was clearly an attack on the autobiographical memory from begin on. And then when in 2021, the mRNA injection started, and I was I knew from my publications that that the spike protein harms the production of these nerve cells. Uh, It was totally clear that that everything converts converts at at one point, and that is uh, in the autobiographical memory. And based on the function of these new nerve cells, which are produced there, it is clear that uh, it shuts down the mental immune system of people. Wow. Now... Why are you the only guy talking about this? Because this seems extraordinarily alarming to me that we've had, I don't know, three quarters of the world's population or some number close to that, uh, half of the world's population that have have taken these um, mRNA vaccines that cause these spike proteins and that could uh, potentially affect the autobiographical memory and therefore exacerbate Alzheimer's and similar, you know, degenerative neurological diseases. And I haven't heard anybody but you talking about this. Yeah, it's amazing, actually, because it was already clear with SARS-CoV-1 in 2002 and 2003, uh, the the, the predecessor, essentially, from SARS-CoV-2, which tried to make a pandemic at the time. But from studies which were published in 2006 and 2007, it was clear that the autobiographical memory by the way, it has a shape, an anatomical shape of a seahorse. That's why it's called the hippocampus. And uh, that the hippocampus is damaged by the spike protein, uh, essentially by all kinds of infections, actually. But the spike protein in particular has the ability to activate the immune system in the brain, similar to the, the cytokine storm that you experience when you have a severe COVID infection. And mm. this neuroinflammation that takes place is the, the most efficient way to shut down the production of new nerve cells in the hippocampus. And just as you know, the hippocampus has to produce these nerve cells not only to avoid depression and Alzheimer's, but also to grow our wealth of experience. So essentially, you shut down the ability to learn new things. 
except if you if you push people to learn things despite the the lack of production but then of course you start to override pre-existing memories with the new narratives and then of course you have the really strong way to indoctrinate people wow so it's not just um neurodegenerative stuff like Alzheimer's, but you're saying also depression is a part of this? Oh, absolutely. Every antidepressant that's out there has the sole function of increasing the production of new nerve cells in the hippocampus. It's called adult hippocampal neurogenesis. That's the technical term for it. And if you shut down this production of these new nerve cells in the autobiographical memory, which is the hippocampus, no antidepressant would work. So that's why it, uh, so the, 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 the opposite is if you shut down the production of the new nerve cells in the hippocampus, then actually your psychological resilience drops, which means you are much more prone to follow the fear mongering narratives because you have no way to, to avoid them essentially, to, to wow. challenge them. And also the new nerve cells in the, in the hippocampus are the neuronal correlate of our natural human curiosity. So by shutting down the production, you shut down curiosity. You just accept what is. Wow. So in effect, you take this vaccine, this could potentially kill your critical thinking, make you less curious. Uh, you'll believe whatever you're being told and ultimately you become some sort of sheep and lose your own individuality. Absolutely. If you want to essentially conquer the world, you, and you want to install a new men, uh, a new operating system, which the rate reset essentially tells us what's going to happen and what all the plans are in the governments that you can see in Germany and everywhere. Uh, if you want to really install a new uh, operating system in society that is uh, against all human yeah, normality, everything against human being, essentially, the sense of being human, then you have beforehand, you have to uh, make something which every computer scientist does when he puts in a new operating system, you have to erase the previous one. Yeah. So the, what, I, what I'm showing is that the create reset has to first uh, apply a create mental reset. And that's exactly what the virus and of course the injections are doing. Wow. Doc, I want you to stick with us. We're going to continue our conversation about your book, The Indoctrinated Brain, How to Successfully Fend Off the Global Attack on Your Mental Freedom by uh, Dr. Michael Nels, MD, PhD. Don't go anywhere. We're coming right back. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Amigos, Merry Christmas. We are uh, discussing the book, The Indoctrinated Brain by Dr. Michael Nels. He's a medical doctor and internationally renowned molecular geneticist. And he's laying out this, in my opinion, shocking uh, chain of uh, circumstantial evidence that indicates that behind the numerous negative influences uh, with these uh, mRNA vaccines and the spike proteins, uh, lies a targeted, masterfully executed attack on our individuality. And um, something that you point out, uh, Dr. Nels, is that despite the raging wars uh, with viruses and whatnot, um, there's also other topics like climate change, uh, national borders, and other things that are likely intended to uh, provide the platform for such uh, an offensive against the human brain. Tell us more about that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's quite simple. I mean, first of all, the fear mongering that takes place uh, activates the neuroinflammatory process similar to the spike protein. So really, it doesn't matter so like listening to a, a show like this one and hearing something that's kind of controversial could do the same thing. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the wow. problem is that if, if, if your brain is stressed, essentially, it looks like for the immune system that it's getting damaged, then the same activation takes place, uh, the new inflammatory process takes place, which shuts down very efficiently the production of new nerve cells in the hippocampus. And if that, if that takes place, then, uh, then of course, your mental immune system breaks down. And the other thing is then if once this breaks down and you can only form new memories because you have no new nerve cells for, for them, then the only way to, to essentially learn new things, even the new narratives that are installed in the brain, can only be installed by, uh, by overriding, erasing essentially previous memories. But there's one thing. The hippocampus learns all these things that are novel, and that are coming with emotions. And so you have to change the topic all the time if you really wanna indoctrinate somebody. You cannot tell them the same story over and over again because that would not erase uh, the previous memories because overriding requires from a neuro neuropathological point of view that the stories have to change. And that also explains why in 2020, despite the fact that everything was well planned, uh, ahead of time, and the mRNA was ready for billions of people in, a, in a such a short time. So everything was well planned ahead, but still, in 2020, you got everyday new messages how people should maybe try to live with a new situation as if they had no plan at all. So that was very kind of weird, but from the point of the view, meaning the point of view of the hippocampus, it's totally clear if you really want to make sure that people eat up everything you tell them and uh, erase previous memories, you have to change the story uh, on a daily basis. Wow. That's fascinating. Uh, that's fascinating. It's kind of, it reminds me of um, this um, uh, term that I heard from um, the, uh, one of the, the folks that worked on the RM, mRNA vaccine, uh, Robert Malone, Dr. Robert Malone. And he said, it's a mass formation psychosis. And at the time, it was kind of crazy to hear something like that. But what you're saying kind of supports uh, th this. Uh, worse than that, yeah. It's actually right, worse. Yeah. <laughs> right, way worse. Kind of the right, and, and, and we're stopping the generation of new nerve cells. Yeah, you, you stop the generation, and then you have essentially laid the groundwork for the overriding process, the, the erasure of personality. And you might have experienced it already that people who actually believe what the narrative tells them, uh, you cannot discuss them, discuss the issue anymore with these people because uh, the, the, the narrative has become part of their personality. So and you're not discussing something abstract. You, you discuss with them their own personality because the narrative has overwritten a part of their personal history. It has become part of their personality by this process because of the overriding in the autobiographical memory. Absolutely, yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's a brilliant evil plan. Uh, how did you stumble upon this? Well, it, it, it's based on my personal history. Uh, I was working on immunology a lot of, a lot of time. My groundbreaking work has even been called a pillar of immunology by the American Society of Immunologists uh, a few years ago. So I have some experience what how Im immunity works, and it was clear to me that what was going on there had not made no sense at all. But I was also in a misfortunate situation that I studied the hippocampus the last 20 years or so in very, very deep, in much detail, up to a point where I could actually propose that Alzheimer's is, a, is caused by, by culture and not by genetics. And so uh, I, I, my book, the people who read it actually don't have not only the chance now to understand the indoctrination process, they also have a chance to avoid Alzheimer's if they, if they uh, follow the ideas that I show in the book. Outstanding. Uh, Doc, I want you to stick with us so we can do a little wrap up and let everybody know where they can get the book. Folks, we're on with Dr. Michael Nels, uh, MD, PhD, he's the author of the book, um, the indoctrinated brain, how to successfully fend off the global attack on your me mental freedom, excuse me, and uh, fascinating, fascinating stuff that we're discussing. Don't go anywhere. I'm Rich Valdez. This 
is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. With an S. All right, America, welcome back and Merry Christmas to everybody that's tuning in this week as we uh, approach the Christmas holiday. We're uh, discussing the indoctrinated brain by Michael Nels, uh, medical doctor and uh, molecular geneticist. And uh, this book is really, again, focused on the, the strategy on how to successfully fend off the global attack on your mental freedom. And, and the premise here is that there's a largely unknown, powerful neurobiological mechanism that is externally um, inducing dysfunction through catastrophic development in your brain. And it's, it's fascinating, right? Because it's, it's using these negative influences in a very targeted way to attack one's individuality and, uh, and using science to go about it. So uh, I'm fascinated by the topic. I think everybody should get a copy or two copies of the book. Christmas is coming. You could put them in uh, stuffing, uh, stuffing. <laughs> you could put them in a stocking as a stocking stuffer uh, or just give it as a gift. And uh, Michael Nels is the author. Dr. Michael Nels is with us. Doc, let everybody know how they can get a copy of the book. Well, you can get it essentially everywhere at Barnes and Nobles, Amazon, or you can just just go to the website of the publisher, which is Skyhorse Publishing. And uh, of course, you can also go to, get, go to my website and see where where the book uh, can be can be ordered. But uh, going to my website actually would be a good idea because you could also get many many more informations, background informations, for sure. example, how the brain fog can be uh, how can you get rid of brain fog after um, uh, the infection or the injection and uh, and what what the best way is and, and, and further further information so uh, what is the uh, website information in the book and and in my website so just go there and what is the website doc uh, it's my name it's michael dash nels n e h l s dot com all right, folks, check it out. Michael dash Nels, N E H L S dot com. You could find out how to fend off this global attack on your mental freedom. And that's the good news that it's not too late by exposing your brain to these damaging processes. Uh, but you learn about these countermeasures that Dr. Nels spells out. Uh, anybody could do this stuff and it'll bring uh, some light and some hope to what's going on right now in human history, which is definitely pretty detrimental based on what we're learning And uh, I think that's fantastic. Michael Nels, I want to thank you for being with us, Doc, for the work that you're doing, and I wish you a great Christmas. Yeah, I wish you a great Christmas, too, and thank you very much for inviting me. You're welcome. We'll do it again soon. All right, folks, there is more to come straight ahead with Open Phone America. We're going to talk about this, how the vaccine could make you dumber and make you believe anything you hear. That's crazy. And, of course, everything else we talked about tonight. Don't go anywhere. I'm Rich Valdez. From the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez. America's favorite late night talk program. Featuring interesting guests from around the world. And calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Hi, 
Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Welcome to the program, hour number three, Monday night. Our phone number, if you want to join our late night national town hall conversation, feel free to give us a call, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. This is the hour of the program where we uh, call it Open Phone America to Old tradition started by Larry King way back in the day, continued by Jim Bohannon, the late, great Jim Bohannon, for three decades, and continued by you all tonight with me as you call in to discuss the, the news of the day. All the topics are on the table. Uh, we talked about a number of things this evening. Uh, we talked about, of course, the indoctrinated brain, how uh, Dr. Michael Nels is explaining how the vaccine is killing the ability to generate new nerves in your brain and your hippocampus so that you uh, actually become more docile to accepting the information that's being given to you. So just imagine that being dumbed down by the vaccine. Fascinating. If you missed that interview, make sure you check it out. Rich Valdez, America at night.com. Check out the website and you could listen to it for free. Just stream it right off the website or you could download the podcast, your podcast app, absolutely free as well. Make sure you do that at richvaldezamericatnight.com. We also um, talked with Brandon Strzok how he won his January 6th civil suit where they said that he was guilty of violating the KKK Act and he was uh, sued by half a dozen uh, minority police officers that say that uh, their injuries were caused by him and other co-defendants. He won that case. They're not bringing another case against them on that charge. And um, kudos to Brandon for winning that. Uh, we also had some discussion with Lee Habib. He's a columnist with Newsweek and a radio host uh, hosting a, a storytelling program called Our American Stories that focuses on loving America and uh, defending Western civilization. And I think that's a fantastic thing. And that was really good. He pointed out how 40 years of hatred being instilled uh, across our college campuses here in our country have led to where we are today with the uh, anti-Semitism and anti-Americanism that um, kind of permeate the college campuses today. And, uh, of course, lots of other uh, topics that you guys are going to bring to the table tonight. But I was looking through social media. And by the way, if you're if you're tuned into my social media at Rich Valdez with an S, you'll see some photos from an event I was just at. And uh, I want to give a quick uh, shout out, a quick word of thanks to Metropolitan Magazine. Metropolitan Magazine uh, named me one of their uh, the um, the Hispanic radio host of the year for 2023. Uh, I was honored uh, to be nominated by uh, Zen Sam's. Uh, who's a radio host as well, and I'm um, thankful to her for the nomination and to them for giving me the uh, the honor of of uh, Hispanic Radio Host of the Year in New York City. Uh, thank you to Metropolitan Magazine, and uh, quite an honor. I am um, I'm very grateful. And <clears throat> anyway, that was a quick aside. But uh, social media, right? If you're on there, you'll see the the photos. And something else I saw on social media was uh, a listener, a listener that was uh, taking exception. Somebody who said, oh, I can't stand your show. You're always covering these crazy topics. Uh, it's like you, he, t he said, he said, I don't have enough intimate moments in my own life. And that's why uh, we discuss so many of the things that are happening uh, in the world. Uh, for example, he was saying it was somehow my fault or a lack of action on my part <laughs> that this Senate staffer that works for Senator Ben Cardin was filming um, a, an adult film in a Senate hearing room with uh, with his with his same sex lover, and I, I I don't see the correlation on how that's my fault in any way, uh, or how talking about something that was a big story last week um, is somehow an obsession with it. Uh, but these were the allegations made against me. And again, you know, I hear a lot of silly things, but I thought that one was interesting. He also said I was fixated on Hunter Biden. And, and I, I think I only talk about Hunter Biden when he's in the news, right? If he goes on a podcast and says something, we talk about it. We'll play the audio. If he um, is in a newspaper, we'll talk about the article. If he does a press conference, a literal press conference where you invite the media to hear what you have to say, like he did last week, right outside uh, the Capitol on the steps, then we're going to talk about that too. 
And I just found it interesting that they were criticizing me for that. And yet there's more news because good old Senator Ben Cardin has now broken his silence after one of his staffers allegedly uh, now fired filmed a sex tape in a Senate hearing room. I mean, this is absolute uh, insanity. But I want you to hear what Senator Cardin had to say today. Breach of trust. Uh, it's my understanding the Capitol Police is doing the investigation. It's a personnel issue. So we clearly will be... Uh, I, I'm not going to comment on the personnel issue. and It's under investigation. What do you mean you were terrible and you're angry? explain like how you came to learn this Over again and, you with know, senator ben cardin he's breaking his silence uh after one of his staff members was fired uh we were just playing the audio but it was a little fuzzy so i'm going to ask our our um our, our guy in the control room count delacula to play it just a little bit louder go right ahead breach of trust uh it's my understanding the capitol police is doing the investigation it's a personnel issue so we clearly will be I'm not going to comment on the personnel issue. And it's under investigation. What do you mean you were terrible? You can you explain like how you came to learn this and you know your emotions and seeing this? Uh, I learned it over the weekend. And, uh, brought it to my attention. Are there any internal investigations happening in your office to figure out you know what went on here? Any hiring practices? You know, this are, these are personnel covered? issues that I won't talk about publicly. All right, so Ben Cardin breaks his silence to say absolutely nothing. I'm not going to speak publicly. Now, listen, I, 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 I'm not going to blame him here. I'm putting myself in his shoes, right? Not to throw the count under the bus, but if the Count Delacula, who's in the control room, was caught doing some sort of untoward thing and um, was caught on video and somebody came to me and said, I want to know what you think about Count Delacula doing this untoward, unmentionable uh, activity in the control room, uh, what say you, sir? I'm going to say, listen, no comment. Well, we're looking into that. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you about it because honestly, I don't know what to tell you about it. So I'm going to, I'm going to go with, uh, I believe the Senator here because I mean, how much can you possibly know? You know, you, you have to ask, they said the Capitol police are doing an investigation. Um, it, it seems pretty cut and dry, right? Somebody who used incredibly poor judgment to do some incredibly stupid things in a horrible, horrible plan to do it in a very, very, um, I don't know, sacrosanct place, right? You don't do that in, in, in the halls of Congress, the hallowed halls of the United States Senate. I mean, who does that? This guy did, right? And I get it. Um, and this was a similar outrage to when Slick Willie uh, got caught out there with, um, hello, Monica, right? I remember that. And it was a big deal for some. Others were applauding him. I get it. I'm sure that's the same thing happening now. It's a big deal for some. Others are applauding him. But it's embarrassing to Senator Cardin, right? It's, it's just not a good look for him. And, you know, in breaking his silence, he uh, basically says, I was angry. I was disappointed. Um, and it's a breach of trust, which you heard him say. But he wouldn't name the staffer in question, only saying it's a personal issue, a personnel issue, uh, a personal personnel <laughs> issue. And um, the senator, who's a Democrat, just like his staffers, um, said he wasn't aware of any further disciplinary issues against the staffer that he hadn't spoken to since firing him. He added that the Capitol Police are, you know, investigating. We knew that. And then that's it. But this scandal broke out on Friday. It was absolutely atrocious. The videos that are blurred out, but you could make sense of it as you see them on social media. Absolutely crazy. I mean, it's just absolutely crazy to think that somebody would go to the United States Senate where you work and make an adult film with your boyfriend or your husband. What man does this? You know, I mean, it's, it's not what he was doing. It's where he was doing it. Right. I mean, I, I don't recommend it either way, but much less in a Senate hearing room. Come on. Anyway, we're going to get to your thoughts on that as well. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S.
Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. All right, America, welcome back. And uh, the musical stylings you're hearing as we bump in from the break are those of a catalog that we use for Christmas music. And I was just uh, discussing with Count Delacula that this Christmas music must be from some obscure country we're not familiar with. Because I don't know any of these songs. I don't know about you guys. I've never heard any of these songs. I like songs like... Dun, 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 Feliz Navidad. You know, you know that one, Jose Feliciano, right? But th these renditions are, are songs I'm just not quite familiar with. But anyway, Merry Christmas. We're going into uh, Christmas week soon, and um, I'm happy to take your calls. We've got some people online. Uh, let me see. We've got calls from all over the place. Uh, 80 miles north of Moorhead City, North Carolina. We've got Boise, Idaho on the line. Clinton, Illinois. The phone's ringing. There's more calls coming in as we speak. The phone number is 833-482-5337-8334. Valdez. And um, let us go to uh, Becky in Clinton, Illinois on WHOW. Becky, welcome. You're on with Rich Valdez. Uh, I'd like to get your opinion on this Senate staffer that worked for Senator Ben Cardin making an adult film in the United States Senate chambers. I say somebody should throw him 20 bucks and tell him to rent a motel. <laughs> right. Well, with Biden inflation, it's probably a lot more than 20 bucks, but I get your point. Well, you know what I mean. Absolutely. And Becky, it's good to hear from you. I haven't heard from you in a while. How have you been? Old as usual. <laughs> I got a couple of things I want to tell you, hon. What's on your mind? Well, number one, um, the governor of California, his aunt is Nancy Pelosi. And you yeah, don't I understand they're that. related. It's supposed to be his aunt, they said. I don't know. Anyhow, and then the second thing, I heard a program the other night, and it was all about Obama how his mother didn't want him and his grandparents took him to Hawaii and they raised him. But when he was a little boy, he, uh, his dad was friends with a neighbor and the neighbor was a communist. Okay. And they said that, um, he hates America. He'll tell you that right out. He hates it. He wanted to run for a third term and he can't do it. And so that's why he's pushing his wife up there to run, and that'll make him, since Biden, it'll make him a fourth term. And that's the reason why Biden is in there, because he pushed him in there. And they said, uh, it's just a puppet. That's all it is. And then the next thing, I was told this, I don't know if it's true or not, I'm going to leave it up to you, that, um, oh, God, no, my brain went dead. Um, <laughs> Happens to me more often than you think. Yeah, I do it all the time, sometimes on the air. Oh, Lord, you just think, what am I doing? Well, you um, know what, I, what you are saying before, I just want to talk about that real quick. Uh, I don't know, um, I read about the relationship between Nancy Pelosi and Gavin Newsom, and from what I understand, they were related, uh, like, sort of like through in-laws, and... Um, and I think they're not anymore because there was a divorce and they're not. So I don't know if she's quite his aunt, but she might have been like his, um, you know, sort of aunt uh, a few times removed through marriage. And that that broke up and they're uh, they've been cleared of that. And the other story with uh, Barack Obama, I believe uh, we might be talking about his mentorship uh, over the years from Frank Marshall Davis, which is where I believe he learned a lot of his um, of his um, communist ideology just my supposition, but did you catch your thought yet, Becky, about yeah. the rumors you're hearing about Joe Biden? No, I heard a friend of mine told me that he heard on the radio that uh, Joe Biden, I don't know if it's legal or not, but they're going after her for uh, elder abuse. So I don't know if they're going to legally do it. I don't know. And then I heard myself, I heard on the radio quite a while back, that he walks around the White House naked. <laughs> well, you know, he wrote about that in a book that he'd uh, done a few years ago uh, where he um, he talked about his he liked to swim in the swimming pool naked. And then uh, uh, some Secret Service agent wrote a book as well. And uh, 
and said that he he was always um, walking around naked, whether they were female Secret Service agents or not. He didn't really care whether they were comfortable or not, but he was totally in the nude because he liked to swim naked. Um, that part I know. So, I mean, if it was walking around the White House, I, I'd probably, um, you know, I'd be inclined to believe that. Um, and given the videos we've seen of Hunter Biden, he's always naked in those videos, too. So, you know, maybe it's a it's a family thing. Who knows, Becky? Well, you would think, you know, maybe that's the reason why they're yelling at Jill, so, saying it's elder abuse, because he doesn't know what he's doing. His cognitive abilities are gone. Yeah, it's, it's tough. I mean, listen, uh, you know, I, I honestly don't know. I think, you know, a lot of people say she's guilty of elder abuse. There's days where I think Joe Biden has no clue what's going on. And then there's days where I think it doesn't matter how lost this guy could be. The only thing he knows how to be is a corrupt politician, uh, you know, a backroom machine politician that cuts deals. And and it seems like that's all he knows how to do. It's all he's ever done. And he's so good at it. Right. I mean, it doesn't matter what the issue is. He just squints. He smiles. He flashes those those. um, those those pearly whites of his and as, as he just uh, puts on the aviators and he's just like, come on, man, I got hairy legs. And, and he just he manages to get his way through everything. And it's just it's remarkable to me the way he's able to pull it off. But he pulls it off nonetheless. And uh, until he doesn't right until people get tired of him. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing with all these polls. Right. We looked at this poll earlier and I thought the numbers were, were fascinating. Fifty four percent of Democrats uh, saying that they want to replace Joe Biden as the 2024 nominee. And this is a poll that that came out of Fox News on Sunday, just yesterday. Fifty four percent saying they want an alternative. Uh, Only 43 percent of Democrat primary voters say they want to keep Biden. So I don't know where that leaves us, Becky, but do you think he's going to be the nominee? I think we've lost Becky. I must have stunned her with my brilliant hair. (laughs) Anyway, folks, we're coming right back. Uh, Your calls and more. Open Phone America continues. The phone number 833-482-5337, 833-4VALDEZ. Becky, I'm sorry we lost you, but you have a Merry Christmas if I don't speak to you again. And folks, don't go anywhere. Don't move a muscle. I am Rich Valdez, and we're coming right back. with an S. Grateful to be on Open Phone America right now with a few people on the line that want to say some stuff about a few things and more calls coming in. But I want to bring your attention to a headline I just saw. It's, uh, let me see, what's this? It's from UPI.com. Here's the headline. Uh, The Women's Film Critics Circle has declared Barbie as 2023's best movie about women. Now, I have to confess, I did not see the Barbie movie, uh, but it was chosen now as or declared by the women, uh, fi- Women's Film Critics Circle. And good for them, right? Good for them. I don't know much about it. We could talk about it. But the the interesting thing is there was a lot of people that took exception to this film, like Senator Ted Cruz and others that were saying that it... it um, took a soft approach on communism and um, and had a very feminist bent to it. Um, I can't really comment on a whole ton of that, but I, I can talk about feminism and how it's crept its way into a lot of things, at least, you know, from my view. And a few weeks back, I saw an old clip of Candace Owens, a conservative commentator with The Daily Wire, and she was talking about toxic femininity. And I thought it was a really interesting clip. It's about a minute. I want you to hear it. Check it out. I really do believe that modern feminism encourages male absence. It encourages it because it's become toxic. Um, They use terms like toxic masculinity, right? And I say to myself, 
all of their examples of the idea of what it means to be a man now is toxic. They think, oh, this is a man. Masculinity is wrong. There's something inherently wrong with being a masculine man. And to me, I always say that it was toxic masculinity that saved me. You know, I had a healthy fear of my grandfather. Nobody played around with my grandfather. They, we still don't play around with my grandfather, you know, and, and it's just there's a certain level of respect when you're in his home. There are rules. And and because I had that healthy fear, I, I was, I guess, more responsive to that sort of authority when I had to go out in real life. You know, I believe believed in structure. And yet this version of feminism today, we have women that are basically promoting men should act like women, right? Yeah. And women should act like men. There's all this confusion. You can pick your gender, you can do what you want. And ultimately what I think it's doing is feeding into this idea of a breakdown of the family. Well, there you go. And I think uh, Candace Owens hit it on the nail on the head there, right? Uh, the, this view uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with um, femininity per se, or even, I guess, feminism, right? That if you believe that women can be more than what they are or what what um, they were once, you know, more than a housewife, yeah, I believe that that's okay. Um, I, I don't believe that um, a woman has to be beholden to the kitchen. Um, I, I don't have a problem if she does want to be. I think that's fantastic. But I, I don't have a problem with that, right? If a woman wants to become a doctor, a psychologist, a radio host, God bless her. Go for it. This is America. Do what you got to do. However, when we start labeling this or that as toxic, whether it's one's femininity or one's masculinity as toxic, I feel like we're missing the mark. And we miss the mark because we get into something that is abstract, right? I think there, there, there is such a thing as misogyny. However, it's misused oftentimes and it's lobbed at people for, you know, as, as, as an attack. And it, the idea is to say, no, you're a misogynist. You hate all women because you may have been critical of, of something that perhaps involved women and voila, you're, you're, that's it. You're done. And, and I think that's a mistake. I think it's also a mistake to think that, you know, one who feels more masculine or thinks that masculinity may be under attack, um, you're free to have that opinion. I think that's probably true in, in most situations. Uh, however, for one to be masculine, for one to want to open a door, for one to, to just, you know, to, to want to defend and protect a, a woman, I don't think this is a toxic trait. Right now, maybe a toxic person can embrace that trait. Um, maybe someone can toxically embrace that trait by not doing it from a position of a, of a pure heart, but more so doing it from a position of coercion or something like that. Then, um, okay, granted, that's pretty, um, I don't know if I could use the word douchey, but sounds like it. And uh, great, that could be considered toxic too. But by and large, I don't think a male... Um, acting or behaving in a masculine manner is a toxic thing. And in the same way, I don't think women who think that they're able to pursue careers that men's one uh, that once were pursued solely by men. I don't think that makes them um, ultra feminist either. But when you become a man hating or misandrist type of feminist, when you um, like she's saying you're pursuing the absence of men or the absence of fathers in the home, because I don't need no man is part of your mantra uh, or even in psychotherapy. And maybe we should bring in some of our psychotherapist friends um, who may or may not have been trained in psychotherapy from this feminist position that believes that, you know, woman, come, for example, woman and her husband get into an argument. Woman goes to her psychotherapist and says, oh, I had a fight with my husband. And the psychotherapist will begin to just fill her head with things that should help her, right? And and give guidance. And in a perfect world, those things are good and healthy. But sometimes in a not so perfect world, like the one we live in, sometimes that information uh, comes across as, well, you, you don't need them and get rid of them. Get rid of them. The, the answer is to be the best version of yourself by yourself. And all I could say to that is, how on earth do you go to a shrink for advice on a relationship and the advice you get is get out of the relationship and be happy being alone. <laughs> it is so incredibly counter and uh, productive and counterintuitive in my opinion. Uh, but that's, that's what's happening uh, so often. So I don't know why or how they, um, they chose the Barbie film 
uh, to be the uh, best movie about women in 2023 by the Women's Film Critics Circle. But I'm curious to know why and how. And again, I haven't seen the film, so I can't really comment it, uh, comment on it in any um, um, very meaningful way because I just have not seen the film. But I find it interesting, and I'd love your thoughts on this um, debate over femininity versus toxic femininity, and likewise with masculinity. Um, let's go to your calls on this and every other topic we've discussed tonight. Uh, let's see, where do we go? Um, we've got... Sarah calling from WBIW, Bedford, Indiana. Sarah, go right ahead. Hey, great show as always. I want to tell you about Hunter Biden. You know, they act like, oh, they're being mean and sending pictures of them naked, okay? We have a legitimate <laughs> concern about his um, cahoots and his sex capades and how that's a threat to our national security. I'll give you an example. Before I became sure. a janitor, I worked at Crane Naval Base as a food worker, okay? So we're for a contractor, but we technically work okay. for the government. And they had an enhanced FBI background check. And me and another girl got called in for an interview. And I go in there. I'm like, well, what are you interviewing me about? I'm like, well, whatever year did you and your husband declare Chapter 11 bankruptcy? I'm like, sure did. We had bills and, you know, uh, the collection and the interest was killing us. And it's how we got out of debt. And they're like, well, are you ashamed of it? I'm like, no, I tell everybody. And I said, well, so why are you asking me about this? And they said, well, we just wondered because some of the people are ashamed of things like that. And then someone can come to them and blackmail them. So, and then the other girl talked to her, and she declared Chapter 7 bankruptcy, and they asked her the same thing. Are you ashamed of it? You, someone came to you and threatened to tell everybody and wanted to blackmail you. Would you fall for the blackmail? And, and that's just commonplace uh, bankruptcy. Now we've got a president whose son's a swinger doing all these embarrassing videos. Yeah, he can get, be blackmailed. That's a very legitimate concern. So, yeah, we have a right to find out what's going on and if that's affected uh, the presidency. Right. No, listen, I'm with you on that one. I think that's 100% accurate. And what's your thought on um, on this idea that that um, femininity is really focused on the absence of men, which uh, I'm calling toxic femininity? No, I agree. The modern-day feminist movement has outlived its purpose or its original noble cause, which is just equal rights for women and basic protections, and it has evolved into just hating men and emasculating men, and it's horrible. It is absolutely horrible. It is the worst form of discrimination because they're claiming to do it under liberation, and it's not. It is anti-man. Men should be proud to be masculine. There's nothing inherently toxic about being masculine any more than there's anything inherently bad about being feminine, and this is just all out an attack and discrimination against men, and, and it's horrible. It's producing horrible fruits. There's more violence against women. And under this toxic femininity, because, you know, you tell somebody they're bad and they're evil, well, they're either going to become feminized or they're going to get mad and lash out. It's horrible what they're doing to men. It's an assault in manhood, and we need strong men. We need protectors. Masculinity has a lot of good traits, and there's nothing inherently wrong with masculinity. Outstanding comments. I, I, I totally agree with you, Sarah. Thank you for the call. I appreciate it. Folks, we're going to continue with the rest of your calls and more straight ahead. Don't move a muscle. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. Valdez. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. All right, America, we go back to your calls. Lots of people from all over the place. Ohio, uh, Moscow, Idaho. Look at that. Uh, we got Moorhead City, North Carolina, 80 miles north. Let's check in with our buddy, Matt. Merry Christmas, Matt. What's going on, man? Hello, Rich. Merry Christmas to you and your staff and your girlfriend or whatever. Thank you. Um, Appreciate it, I want to say, thank you. 
it's very disgusting what Biden has done to this country. And I, I mentioned to your call screener, I don't, she didn't say her name. Of all the radio hosts I talked to, seven, What's her name again? none of them voted for Joe Biden. And also, the hundreds of billions of dollars of our money he's given away to other countries, including the one slept in Afghanistan, the all military equipment. Your thoughts, sir? Well, listen, Matt, I think you're 100 percent right. First, I want to say uh, I want to thank Jessica Curtis for being with us tonight. She's been uh, working the phones with us tonight. She's a fantastic producer, lots of experience. She's quite remarkable, and I'm glad she's here. And with respect to Joe Biden, Joe Biden is uh, obviously a disgrace and, and, in my opinion, engineered a deal that we've seen a million different times, right? Whenever you see something that looks like a sitting duck, when you're shooting uh, ducks in a barrel here, shooting fish in a barrel, I should say, uh, like Hillary Clinton with her classified information on her secret illegal um, server, right, for her emails, this is obviously, to me, this is like a gift, right? It's like saying, look, I don't want you to steal my car, but it is running, outside with the keys in it the windows are down and the spare and everything is loaded in the trunk you got everything the manuals in the uh in the glove box okay just saying but don't steal the car right i feel like this is kind of how it went with afghanistan i was like look we uh we want to make all right look we're gonna leave you got it we're gonna leave everything behind we don't want to give you the weapons but we're leaving everything behind and and again it was a massive transfer somebody got paid on that somewhere you don't just leave everything behind I, i don't care how stupid you might think i am i'm really not that stupid Nobody gets something for nothing. That's number one. Um, so I think we're, we're seeing that time again, time and again, time and again. Now we have um, these these payments uh, in the form of aid, 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 and more aid. This is Biden's thing, right? He's just doing it now under the guise of a war, whereas in the past it was under the guise of USAID and other types of foreign aid that that he would negotiate for people to have and be like, look we're going to get you this we're going to get you that we're going to get you that and you're going to all right what you're going to do you're going to kick back a little bit to me you're going to give it to my son hunter and you're going to put him on the board you're going to do this and you're going to do that and then he'd, he'd get the kick back off of hunter and it this it's it's an old scheme that it, it should not be allowed he should be impeached hunter should be jailed in my opinion and we should put an end to this you have to make examples of people so that people won't continue to spend your money and my money because ultimately that's what they do I mean, if this were an insider trading deal, who would be mad? I wouldn't be mad. That's not my money. I'm mad when it's my money. And I think that's the problem here, Matt. Thank you for the call. God bless you, my brother. Merry Christmas to you. Uh, Let's see. Let's do another one right here. Let's go to Paul, Boise, Idaho. Go right ahead quickly. Thanks, Rich. Thanks for taking my call. You bet. I just a couple to be light and not too heavy like I usually am. You know, I. I got the fake news report that actually Biden was driving and got into the accident. And uh, I'm glad he didn't get hurt. But yeah, it just me too. goes to show he shouldn't be driving at 81. <laughs> well, he wasn't driving. Right? <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. <laughs> that is a good point, yeah. Paul. I appreciate it. Now, tell me what you think about this um, toxic femininity uh, as as uh, I'm I'm calling it right now, what um, what are your thoughts on the modern feminist movement making the play to eliminate um, men or you know thrive on the absence of men? It's open season on masculinity or anything that they do or say. It, it goes back to Rush Limbaugh back in the early '90s when he coined the phrase. Feminazi. I don't know if you remember that. Feminazi, sure. That. Yeah, I totally yeah, remember that. And and it's 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 now been on steroids that we're on it now, and so it's it's like I said, it's open season on men. You know, no matter whether we try to be too cutesy and too nice to them, they don't like it. Too too masculine, too macho, they don't want it. So what yeah. do you do? You know, you can't be a bookend and enjoy life. You got to get involved on the rest of the pages. Yeah, I hear that, brother. Paul, thank you for the call. I appreciate it. We're going to take a quick pause right here. Merry Christmas, Paul, by the way, if I don't speak to you before then. And uh, we're coming right back. Don't move a muscle. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, 
right, America, welcome back. Christmas week is upon us, and it is, what do we call this? The speed round. So keep your comments to about one sentence. Daniel, Moscow, Idaho, listening online. Rich Valdez, America at night.com. Go right ahead quickly. Hey, Rich. First time caller. Thanks for having me on. I just want to get right Thank into you. and kind of follow up on the other caller who was talking about Democrats. And if you're a working man, you got to vote Democrat. And I think that's not a good idea because even though I like, can sympathize that the Democrat Party doesn't have, uh, you know, the same problems as the Republican Party, they don't believe in the working man either. And so when you look at the midterms, what you have is the Republican Democratic wave, or they were looking for a red wave. Well, guess what? We got an APAC Jew wave instead. So that's something that we got to really look at and consider as Americans is, is our interest with America or is it with some other foreign country in Israel is trying to bomb a bunch of now, When you're talking about APAC, who are you specifically are you talking about? The American Israeli political. Now, I know what they are, but who, who are you speaking about that got elected? Well, like 96% of all the candidates who won the midterms were APAC-funded candidates. I wasn't aware of that. I'll have to look into that. Yeah, we'll take a look at that and get back to it. Uh, I I wasn't, (laughs) I don't see what one has to do with the other. But thank you, Daniel, for your call. I appreciate it. And it seemed like I said one sentence, and I was hoping you'd get straight to your point, which is there's a two-party system and not offering choice. But instead, you started talking about the Jews. Anyway. Uh, let's see now with less than a minute to go, took time from everybody else. Let's go to Patrick KVTA Ventura, California. Really one sentence. Go for it. Uh, great, Rich. Glad to talk to you. Um, <clears throat> thank you real quick before my point. Um, here in Southern California, we pronounce it Balboso. All right. <laughs> El Baboso. I lost you there, Patrick. I'm sorry about that. Uh, When I say one sentence, I mean it. Like, Joe Biden's ugly and he smells bad. Thank you. Anyway, I appreciate you guys. Uh, Wish everybody a very, very, very good night. Take care, America. Hasta la próxima. Until the next time, God bless.